Hey guys, uh, welcome to episode 80 of Van Gogh Letters and things are definitely kind of going up a couple of notches. In this letter, Vincent actually refers to his own derangement and he also talks about, it's quite troubling, he sort of says that it's something that he's been aware of for a long, long time and this then brings up the question, was he actually mad after all? I mean, if he's talking about it himself and he's kind of admitting it, then who are we to say that that's not true, right? Uh, good to see you guys all here. Uh, Iceland, Jelsey, Lamtoon, Sharon. <laughs> it's good to see you guys. Without, given, without being given a lot of notice, you, you nevertheless are here. Um, I will be in America later this week, uh, assuming the structural integrity of my plane is, is going to be okay. Um, that is kind of an assumption, I guess. Uh, it is now an assumption one's got to make. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it is kind of exciting. I, I must say I'm a little, little anxious, but trying not to be, um, inappropriately anxious um i was actually just watching something on television where they were doing middle east marketplace and they're talking about dubai being the biggest city in the world or the number one city in the world or the most prestigious city in the world and and then the very next segment was was talking about art and so that is one of the ways that a city defines itself as um above in and beyond everywhere else you know what what culture does it um what cultural claims can it can it make and i suppose in dubai's case you can transport artworks to that that city and then it it's a, i'm not saying it's not a place worth going to without that but that would make it a place worth going to. I mean, imagine if the Mona Lisa ended up in a museum in Dubai. You know, you might want to go to Dubai to see the Mona Lisa. Could one say the same thing about New York, that the painting behind me, Starry Night, arguably one of the most... Um, the, the painting that means the most to the Western world. I mean, is that an exaggeration to say that? is in a museum in New York, not in Europe, not, 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 not even in the home country of Vincent van Gogh. So, um, you know, uh, isn't that what New York tried to do? Um, you know, uh, have the best art from the most prestigious artists as a way of symbolically saying, this is the zenith of human achievement, the city, right? I just find it quite interesting that in the one breath I was saying Dubai is the world's number one city and the next segment was about art, um, art that's not really, f not originally from Dubai. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is, if you think about it, we are now rolling out the red carpet, we, we, we're now approaching kind of the landing strip of Starry Night. Essentially, what the last dozen, 20 episodes have really been about is what led to Starry Night, what, um, what psychology was brewing in the artist that kind of gave birth to Starry Night, right? Joe Martin, good to see you. Lynn Lippi, good to see you as well. Um, And I, I find it really fascinating that, and we're going to deal with it in this letter, um, this letter, or well, it's actually the next letter, where he talks about derangement. That's where I got the title for this, this video. That in the weeks before he paints Starry Night, he, he is literally thinking about madness. He is thinking about 
mental disturbia. He is concerned about his state of mind that 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 is not um, it's not normal. It's not settled. It's not uh, calm. It's not. Um, it's a kind of disquieted thing. And if you think about it, the title Starry Night, doesn't it? Doesn't that title make you think of a peaceful, it's almost like Silent Night. And yet, if you think about Starry Night, it's very vivid, it's very turbulent, it's very um, um, arguably disturbed. It's, it's arguably a disturbed heavens above roiling above a quiet town and so what is van gogh actually trying to say through that painting is he trying to say that the heavens are magnificent or is he trying to say the heavens are um kind of whirling and chaotic and scary just like my mind, right? You know, what is he actually trying to say through that painting? And I have been saying for quite a while now that I actually think Starry Night is misinterpreted by most of us. We see what we want to see. We see um, the electricity of life in the sky in a way that we find magical and beautiful and joyful but i'm not sure that's what he was actually trying to say i don't think i don't think he was trying to say that but let's see let's find out let's find out um Jalsi says magnificent uh karen says mysterious uh mal says story night speaks to me of great emotional eruptions yeah. But are they good emotional eruptions or are they are they troubling? And I, I think most people think of Story Night in a positive way, um, in a way that they feel inspired. It seems to be a optimistically creative way of looking at at the sky, right? Is that what he meant to say? Is that what he meant to say? So let's um, let's go to um, the letters. Um, I do want to share something that for me is tremendously powerful, and I hope it's going to inspire you. I'll I won't indulge in that right now. I'll leave it for a little bit later. So um, I want to talk a little bit about. Um, reinventing oneself, uh, kind of being reborn. I, I'm not sure if I like that term, uh, but basically um, this idea of where you um, come alive again, I guess. Um, trying to think of what's a good word for that. Not so much resurrection, but, but kind of where you, I guess where you reinvent yourself, where you, um, where you, um, awaken again, but but not in the same way. It's not just that you awaken and and do something. It's that you actually um, re. It's really a, a reinvention um, that I want to talk about. And in a way, this is exactly what Van Gogh is about to do. He's about to his whole life is about to die, um, in a sense, and. Do, when he's in the asylum, uh, he's going to sort of, in a way, in a way, stagnate, and in a way, um, what's the word? Um, he's going to reach rock bottom, but then from there, he basically uh, restarts himself, and he, and when he does that, he's invigorated, he's refocused, he's kind of a new man. And so out of the darkness, there is light. Out of the adversity and suffering, there is something positive that comes out of it. The interesting thing with Story Night is Story Night actually caps the end of a 
the end of um how can i put it basically the end of a fairy tale and the beginning of his nightmare story night is actually um a, the the end of a um chapter in his life where he had a bit of agency and where things were going quite well and again in that sense i don't think it's a very positive picture i, I think he's kind of talking about almost maybe being powerless under the fates or something like that so i want to reimagine is quite a good word you know where you reimagine yourself and thus a new version of yourself comes into being um i think the word i'm really looking for is this one and i, I mentioned it somewhere i think i may have done it in a previous uh van gogh letters um it's not it's not rebirth and it's not being refreshed it's not it's not the same thing again it's something new so in other words it's it's you but it's a new version of you right and and that's kind of what i want to talk about renewal and sorry night to me um basically is the end of Van Gogh's renewal in terms of the whole um, uh, studio in the South, the attempt to exhibit at the World Fair, the, the whole Yellow House dream. Story Night is almost like the, the final nail in the coffin of that idea. And if you think about it, you would never think that because it actually feels like Story Night is the beginning of something, right? It almost feels like it's something, it's the catching of fire in someone's heart, in someone's mind, in someone's soul, and they then, um, you know, burst forth or something. The reality, though, is that Story Night was actually like the, um, the end of that dream. And again, I think in that sense, it's actually quite a dark, troubled, unhappy picture from his perspective it's just so interesting that someone else could look at that and say wow this is so beautiful and so magical i'm inspired by this okay shall we get going so um i just want to see if there are any other people you haven't greeted deborah d is everyone in class here yvonne p uh lamb i think i've mentioned you cornelia good to see you all um, I just want to take you back one letter uh, where basically, do you remember where Theo said to Vincent, I was greatly touched by your letter. I think you may be making far too much of something which is entirely natural, right? Um, he also said to him, you know, um, your work as well as your friendship is of greater value than all the money I shall ever possess. What a what a wonderful sentiment from Theo, just showing that Theo really does have a one a, a beautiful heart and a, is a very um, is is a really great asset. Um, I don't know if that's the right word, but he certainly is um, such an important person for a person like Van Gogh. You know, I don't think without Theo there would not be Vincent Van Gogh. Without this support system, uh, Vincent van Gogh would not have, as far as I'm concerned, been allowed to exist. And I think there are many people who um, who have dreams and and but but certainly didn't have sponsors, right? Um, I I can't help watching uh, world class triathletes. That, that was a journey that I was starting to go on. Uh, I would have loved to have been a um, professional athlete of some kind, a swimmer or a cyclist or a triathlete or something. And but but what I see with the pros that are out there, they have an incredibly powerful support system around them: family, friends, uh, sponsors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I didn't have that when I was when I was a, a kid. I mean. If anything, my father discouraged me from doing triathlon. He felt it was 
very indulgent. I think he felt it was very expensive. He felt it was very, it was distracting me from the business of basically getting to work. And so obviously in a situation like that, you're not going to get very far. On the other hand, if you had someone who said, wow, you know, you've done this, you've done that. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to back you. Um, even though you're not winning, you know, like Van Gogh wasn't selling his art, even though you're not winning, um, I just believe in your spirit or whatever. Who knows what could have happened, right? Anyway, so let's deal with the the letter following the 24th of April. We are going slightly forward in time. You know, it's where I am, it's the 22nd of April already. It's 20 past five in the morning where you guys are still the 21st. So we are going slightly ahead of time. Um, but uh, we won't go through too many letters. We'll go through maybe two or three. Okay, ready. Uh, absolutely, very supportive. I think we all wish or hope that uh, we could have a Theo in our lives or that we could be, um, I don't know if we hope that we could be someone's Theo, but... If, if we can't have a Theo in our lives, maybe we can be a Theo to somebody else. Okay, so let's have a look here. 25th to the 28th of April, the, the date of this letter is not uh, certain, but it's somewhere around late April. Uh, and, and think about this letter in the context of his brother saying, you know what, um, it's painful to hear about your health. Uh, are you not making too much of this? Also, uh, um, he also says, I was very greatly touched. Um, he also talks about, um, I know you well enough to consider you capable of all, imaginal sacri all, all imaginable sacrifices. Um, anyway, a very, he also talks here about, these three options. You could come here for some time, or you might go to Port Arthur, or you might go abroad, uh, or, sorry, go and board with people who would take care of you, right? And then he, Theo also talks about just how happy he was with, um, with Joe. He talks about her being the wedding, giving, it, giving her a lot of pleasure. I think that's the mother. But also he talks about just how happy he is in his own life at this point. Um, he says for himself, I never dared hope for so much happiness. And it's in that context that Vincent writes this reply. My dear Theo, thanks for your kind letter. Thanks for the good news it contained. Also for the 100 franc note. I was very, very glad to hear that you feel easier in your mind since your marriage. Then... Then one thing that gave me great pleasure was you're saying that mother looks as if she were growing younger. Naturally, very soon or even now already, her mind will be running on seeing you with a child. That is dead certain. Uh, that that's almost seems to be not a not a joke, but a, but a little bit of a um, you can you can imagine between the two brothers, they know their mother very well, and they are predicting what is going to happen next in terms of their mother's expectations. And I don't think it's rocket science to say, you know, obviously when people get married, your first thought is, first or second thought is, so, uh, you know, when you're going to start a family, right? Uh, about a week ago, I had dinner with some friends and, and their kids had recently gotten married and, Although I was looking at them and thinking, you know, I wonder whether when they're going to start a family. I didn't, I didn't actually ask them because I, I find that a bit, it's a bit of unnecessary pressure. I think I wouldn't. I don't know if I would like to be asked that. And um, is that really something you've got to answer to strangers? Not not strangers, but is that really something you've got to um, deal with? I'm just saying it's it's not. Um, it's not any surprise that someone would think that or say that. And, of course, this is now being asked of Theo. Um, in a way, if you translate that to an artist, 
Um, it's almost like I'm an artist. Okay, so when when is your next big painting? You know, that's like the, the child of an artist. Yeah, it's kind of like none of their business. So, um, so he says, I very much regret for your sake and for your wife's too that you are not living at Ville de Avre, for instance, instead of in Paris. But that will come, I hope. The great thing now is that you should pick up again instead of wearing yourself down. Um, so, you know, he seems to be aware that, you know, ideally for Theo, it would be if he lived somewhere in a certain, um, in a certain situation. Then he says, and this is quite important, he says, I went to see Monsieur Souls and took your letter for the director of the asylum at saint Rami, And so basically he takes Theo's letter, which is essentially kind of like a permission slip, kind of like his ticket to say, this is my, this is the authorization I'm getting for me to go into the asylum. That's what I want to do. And here is my authorization essentially from my guardian from our patron. For myself, I shouldn't be unhappy or discontented if sometime from now I could enlist in the Foreign Legion for five years. They take men up to 40, I think. Now, that is a really kind of sad statement as far as I'm concerned. I think it shows that Van Gogh is very discombobulated in a sense. He's very... Um, the whole trajectory of his life has been blown up. Um, right. And he is basically fishing for the next, um, the next thing that he needs to do. He, he is feeling a bit lost. He's feeling like a fish out of water. He's lost his community. You know, he, he belonged to, the neighborhood and community of old, he's lost that. He belonged to the yellow house, he's lost that. And now he's looking for a new anchor, right? He's looking for something to anchor the next leg of his journey, right? Discombobulated. To be discombobulated means to be confused or disconcerted, right? And so that is exactly where he is right now. He is uncertain. He's, he doesn't know what he's supposed to do. He's, he's basically um, lost his way, right? And now he's searching for the path that he must go on from here. And he, he's really got no idea what to do. And so he's thinking of becoming a soldier, that does seem to suggest, and again, what is so incredible about this is it's essentially one month before he paints Starry Night. It's essentially um, almost the end game of a painting that will change the history of art forever and, and in a way, uh, in some way, touch millions and millions of lives, right, in a positive way. And he's thinking of becoming a soldier. And, and you would imagine art's probably not going to feature in that story. It, it seems a little bit of a way of saying, I'm going to do something completely different, right? I can't imagine soldiers being able to allow to paint paintings. I don't know if there are, there are any good examples of that. Um, anyway, War photographers, yes, but not, and, and war reporters, but, but not painters. So anyway, he says, from the physical point of view, my health is better than it used to be. And perhaps being in the army would do me more good than anything else. What an incredible thing to say. You know, if you think about it, um, we think Van Gogh is going to the asylum because he is sick in some way, mentally sick, physically sick, um, because he is broken down. Meanwhile, he's thinking of going to the army. I mean, in a weird way, it's hard to think of a weaker soldier than Vincent van Gogh. What I mean is, um, at this time, you know, 
when he go when he's lost his ear, when he's lost his friends, when he's lost his way, it's, it's hard to think of a weaker soldier than Vincent van Gogh. You, you would imagine if he went out into the trenches that he would not be um, one of the strongest soldiers. On the other hand, he is a physically resilient fellow in the sense that he's he walks a long way. He's quite a tough SOB. You know, he walks great distances. Um, you know, as a young man, he once walked from, I think, London to Ramsgate, which is a heck of a long way to walk. Um, and so he is quite a physically strong person, although where he is now, I, I think he actually did have syphilis and he's certainly not in his prime and, and things are about to get worse. So I do think... Although he recovered from the ear incident, he's actually um, about to go through a really bad spell. He's about to go through a kind of, um, uh, it's almost like catching COVID like I did. You know, your your whole life, uh, not your whole life, but but your path kind of comes to a bit of a stop. And then it, you've got to rebuild a bit from there. Anyone who's got COVID, anyone who's had COVID probably knows what I'm talking about. You sort of um, need quite a period of time to rebuild yourself and even maybe rebuild your your thinking. So um, Helena says he just wants to belong somewhere. Mel says he was very resilient. Yeah. <laughs> he would be writing letters in the trench. But can you see how close he came in a way to to going on a different path? You know, and he doesn't just mention it once and then he doesn't. He, he's basically saying, in a way, he's saying, should I go to the asylum or should I go to the army? And you almost get the idea that that what he wants is companionship. And he's almost desperate to get it any way he can. Maybe I'll have what's better, army companions or sort of mentally ill folk. He says, anyway, I don't say that we must or can do this without consideration and consulting a doctor. But after all, we must count on it, whatever we do. It will not be quite, quite so good as one could wish. But if not, naturally, I can always do painting or drawing as long as it will work. And I do not in the least say no to that. Now, I'm going to deal with the next part of his letter, but think about kind of what's going on here, the context. Theo has gotten married. And I mean, it's only coming up now in the end of April, four months later, essentially, four, four months after the year incident, where basically he is feeling... Um, He's feeling like Theo is about to have a child and he's feeling like there may be a limit on the resources that are available to him. And he knows that he's lost all his social currency in all, right? And it's within that context that it, it, there, there almost seems to be a sense of him thinking, Theo, you need to move out of Paris to, to that, that suburb, which would be better for being married and raising children. You know what I think? I think I need to go where it's not going to cost you anything. I'll, I'll go to the asylum. Maybe I should go to the army. It, it's hard not to think that those aren't related to one another, right? The part that I think you've got to be careful, so art experts probably looked at this and said, that's why Van Gogh cut off his ear. He he knew he wasn't going to be able to continue painting because Theo's now got other priorities. But if you look at what's going on here, no, him and Theo discussed it. Theo also said to him, you know what, money really isn't such a big deal. If Theo had said to him, like in 10 or 20 or 30 letters, Vincent, I'm sorry to say this to you, but, but money is a really big deal. Um, I'm sorry, this, uh, we're going to need to do that. Um, then it would be different. Of course, we can't really see Theo's letters, but you don't really get a sense 
of that from Vincent's letters. You don't really get a sense where he says, you know, what you said about that and that and that, um, I must insist I'll be allowed to paint. He doesn't seem to say that. Anyway, let's go on. He says here, um, as for coming to Paris or going to Pont Arvin, I do not feel I can. Besides, most of the time I have uh, uh, no very keen desire or keen regret. So, you know, um, what's, what's quite crazy here is he um, feels like he's got the, the energy, the verve, the um, capacity to become a soldier. Uh, he's got the energy and the motivation to go to an asylum but he doesn't have the energy to go to Paris. And I, I think the reason for that is it feels like he's going backwards. And I think although going to an uh, asylum might feel a bit like that anyway, or going to the army might not, I don't think he, he wants to, he's 36 years old. He kind of wants to be moving forward in the same way that his brother's gotten married Um and, and um, don't forget Gauguin is also, you know, selling his art and, and doing what he's doing. I think he feels like if he returns to Paris, symbolically it's going to feel like failure. And it isn't like that feeling. And, and the irony is that ultimately that is exactly what he did. He returned to Paris. And by then that failure thing was it was so um i think it was so it, it it absorbed it so much that eventually it wasn't there anymore um have you ever had that feeling when um maybe you were in love with someone and somebody betrayed you and it's extremely heartbreaking it's extremely painful and then when you realize the extent of that betrayal it's so enormous that, that you, you you simply you almost like to shrug because it's almost like impossible to deal with. So you just sort of um, don't deal with it. You know, whereas if the mountain was a bit smaller, you could make a list of things and you could make your sort of argument about what you deserved and whatever. But now it's so huge that you're just like, okay, well, I'm, what, 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 what can one really do about this? The odds were against me kind of thing, right? I think it's the same thing. By the time he returns to Paris, his failure is so complete that he's in a way just saying, well, look, all I really want to do is paint a little bit, and, and if I can, that's good enough for me. In other words, he's in a way, um, I don't want to say accepted defeat, but but um, he's no longer resisting it in a way, in, in the way that he was, right? Okay, so he goes on to say, Sometimes, just as the waves pound against the sullen, hopeless cliffs, I feel a tempest of desire to embrace something, a woman of the domestic hen type. But after all, we must take this for what it is, the effect of hysterical overexcitement rather than a vision of actual reality. So, you know, you can tell that Vincent is feeling um, envy for his brother. He's feeling, well, I, I wish I had a woman. I wish I had um, a, a home, right? Um, he's not, you know, what he's talking about here isn't sex. It's really kind of a, a settled situation. Um, he's, he's, he's not being motivated here by desire or by ego is being motivated by by in a way anxiety saying well if only i was just in like a subtle place and um but he also realizes that thought you know i wish i could just snap my fingers and and, and i could just be in a domestic setting with a with a um i don't want to say an average wife but but just with a kind of ordinary person, you know, I, I'm not asking for a lot. I just want to be with with someone who who I could be with and she could be with me and 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 so I'd be in this settled situation, right? But he describes this um, not 
unrealistic feeling or hope as extremely unrealistic. For most of us, you would say that that's not very far-fetched. I mean, you could meet someone that, that you like who likes you and get married. His brother's just done it. Why couldn't he do it? He describes the idea as waves pounding against sullen, hopeless cliffs, just that it's um, it's a hopeless um, dream. He also describes the feeling of wanting this as a tempest of desire. I don't think he means sexual desire. I think he kind of means it's almost like he's, he's got this sudden urge to be in a similar situation as his brother. Um, I kind of know what he's talking about. I don't so much mean the married part, but, you know, for 10 years at least, I um, traveled and moved all over the world. Even in my own country, I was traveling, or not traveling, but I would live in one city, and then a few months later, I would live in another city, and then another city. Um, in 10 years, I, I lived in... Uh, the United Kingdom, um, Scotland, just south of Wales, uh, London, just outside of London. But, I mean, in the two years I lived in the United Kingdom, I must have moved uh, six to eight times. And then I was in South Korea for four or five years. And when I was there, I moved three times, I think. And, and then I was in South Africa, and I must have moved five, five or ten times. And when you've gone through that whole period, you suddenly feel like, wow, I really need to be settled um, for, for a variety of reasons. You know, you keep leaving friends behind. You keep leaving the things that you've accumulated behind. Um, you keep um, disrupting your, your life when that happens. And Vincent's also feeling, I think, that is like, geez, I need to put down roots somewhere. I need to just be in one place for a length of time. And if you think about it, um, the longest he ever spent anywhere after leaving home as a teenager was when he moved back home. So when he was in Newnan, and, and that wasn't a terribly long time. And it was also, uh, he, was, he was where others didn't want him to be even his own parents didn't really want him around and so he kind of wants to be somewhere where he is um wanted right okay let's continue then he says um besides ray ray and i have laughed about it sometimes meaning his doctor for he says that love is a microbe too which does not surprise me much and could not shock anyone, it seems to me. Isn't Renan's Christ a thousand times more comforting than so many paper mache Christ that they serve up to you in the Duval establishments called Protestant, Roman Catholic or something, or other churches? Now, it's interesting that he's talking about this, this sort of aspect because, you know, his own father is a Roman Catholic sorry, a Protestant pastor, no longer alive, of course, and he himself wanted to be a pastor as well, especially in the Borinage. Uh, you can see that he's departed on that journey. Uh, he, he doesn't have the same uh, faith that he did then. It's, his faith has changed. And now perhaps his faith is going to change again. He says, as soon as I can, I'm going to read Renan's Antichrist. So that's kind of quite weird. You know, it's almost like he's in the midst of, in the midst of um, this crisis that he's in. He's understandably going down some dark alleys. You know, um, he, to his brother, he might be somewhat positive, somewhat um, neutral, and so on. But he certainly must be feeling despair. And th there's a symptom of that. 
He says, I haven't the slightest idea what it will be like, but I believe beforehand that I shall find one or two ineffable things in it. Oh, my dear Theo, if you just if you just saw the olive groves just now, the leaves old silver and silver turning to green against the blue and the orange colored plowed earth. It is something quite different from your idea of it in the north, the tender beauty, the distinction. So can you see how he jumps almost from one moment thinking in these darkly religious um, terms and themes he suddenly comes out of that when he thinks about color he, he, he finds relief from these dark ideas when he remembers the vividness of nature and that is that is kind of who van gogh is you kind of get the sense that for a lot of his life, he was trying to um, make something of the discomfort, the difficulty, the despair, the hardness of his life, the, the struggle. And what he did with that, how he transmuted that, was he um, felt the color, saw the color, captured the color, to, made the color basically sort of vivid and animated, right? And that he kind of um, makes the world a richer place because he wants it to be, because that's what he needs to believe, right? Can you hear my dog snoring? <laughs> okay, anyway, so he goes on to say, it is like the pollard willows of our Dutch meadows. You guys know what a pollard is, eh? It's a tree that's um, the, up, the top branches are trimmed away every season and then they eventually become like stumps. And then out of these stumps, um, the rest of the tree sort of branches out and grows every spring and summer. It's kind of um, to keep the tree relatively um, small, I guess. Uh, this is uh, what pollarding is, right? Promotes the growth of a dense head of foliage and branches. In ancient Rome, Propertius mentioned pollarding during the first century BC. The practice has occurred in, commonly occurred in Europe since medieval times to maintain trees at a determined height or to place new shoots out of the reach of grazing animals. That's quite interesting. Traditionally, people pollarded trees for two reasons, for fodder. So you, you cut the trees down to give, to, to use those branches and leaves as fodder for animals or for wood. That actually makes sense. I didn't know that. There's a really beautiful image of pollarded willows in Germany. A couple of examples. I really like this, this one really quite a quite a nice one so on the on the topic of pollarded trees um, my sister told my dad so, so my sister's staying in a in a unit that my dad owns and there's a big tree casting shade over a garden and I know this tree quite well uh, because it's a pollarded tree. And my sister was complaining that she's not getting enough sun into her garden. So she kind of asked my father to cut it down. And he didn't really want to cut it down. And I said, why don't you just pollard the tree? You know, if you pollard the tree, then, then you're not going to have, certainly in winter, you're not going to have... Um, the shadow over the garden 
And instead of doing that, she insisted on having the tree cut down. It was a big, big tree. And uh, she insisted on, on having the tree cut down. And that's exactly what happened. After the tree was cut down, she wasn't very happy because now the neighbors could see right into her garden. Of course, too late, the tree's gone now. So how's that? How's that for an interesting story? Okay. Um, anyway, that's pollarding. So he says, it is like the pollard willows of our Dutch meadows or the oak bushes of our dunes. That is to say, the the rustle of an olive grove has something very secret in it and immensely old. So once again, he's taking a kind of comfort in the landscape. You know, he is getting a sense of relief from pain, from just the, these ruts and tracks, these thoughts that he's got to go on, go down constantly. Um, can you imagine um, lying in bed, staring at the ceiling and thinking, the folks in this village hate me, they're trying to get rid of me, then that's on top of him losing the yellow house, that's on top of the betrayal of Gauguin, that's on top of him losing his ear. And and then on top of that, his brother's blissfully happily, happy, his brother's um, not really available, uh, you know, his brother's not going to kind of come to him. Um, can you imagine sort of lying in bed and just thinking about this bind that is in that, that it, he can't really escape, you know, this is his lot. And he must be thinking, Tipas, how did this happen? How, do, how, how did I end up in this? horrible hole right and also how do i get out of it and so in a way the way that he gets through gets escapes that hole is he just sees where he is and he sees wow the sun is shining um the seasons are changing um listen to the beautiful sound of um the trees and um look at this place that we're in the trees are incredibly old. You know, nature is speaking to him, right? And in the same way that the ancient nature is talking to him in terms of the, the trees, isn't that also what he's tuning into in Starry Night, the, the ancient stars, you know, that, that they are also filled, of, filled with secrets, also immensely old, also in a way whispering in the, in the skies above. So, you know, that is in a way how the artist creatively solves the unsolvable problem, the problem of mortality, the problem of anxiety. He goes into the world and he finds a solution. And he finds a solution in, in nature, in the colors of nature, in the, the worlds and the whirlpools of nature, right? He says, it is too beautiful for us to to dare to paint it or be able to imagine it. The oleander, ah, that speaks of love and is beautiful like the lesbos of Pubis de Chavan with women on the seashore. But the olive is different. If you want to compare it to something, it is Delacroix. And so, I mean, can you believe it? Is is literally comparing trees, in this case olive trees, to the most beautiful woman in his imagination the the um the woman on this on, on a particular seashore a, a sort of le legend of woman on a particular sea seashore uh it talks about the olea so it is literally thinking about trees as the central moving whispering um wonderful kind of apparitions you know there's this almost um oasis like reprieve in that and and i have to say when i went to nature's valley i certainly felt very um um i don't know if the words comforted I, I felt very um soothed by the the forests and um one of the main reasons i actually went to nature's valley was i'd had two or three absolutely terrible nights where i just felt extremely um i don't know unsettled um and and I, I just sort of felt i need to get out of my bedroom and my bed and and um 
maybe that green is going to have an inf- impact on me. And it literally did. I was quite surprised. I mean, if I'd gone there and had a horrible night there, I, I don't know what I would have done. But um, anyway, so he goes on to say, this letter ends abruptly. I wanted to talk to you about lots more things, but it is just as I've already written. My ideas are not orderly. And there is a kind of jumpiness to this letter. You can tell that he is, um, he is in a way uh, quite lost. He sort of jumps onto this thought and then he jumps onto that thought. And then this is really um, activating his um, joy, sense of joy. And, and, then, and then there's that dark path that, that is um, troubling him, right? And I wouldn't be surprised if what is actually going on here is it is the syphilis that is starting to take control in a way, right? And and uh, what I mean by that is um, we tend to think we are in control of our own bodies. We tend to think that we're in control of our own thoughts. But there's a point where you can cross the line from um, that sense of uh, capacity over oneself to where other things start taking over, whether you want to call it disease, whether you want to call it chemicals or whatever you want to call it, when you are no longer actually in control of your body. So, you know, somebody who has diabetes, they, they can't control their blood sugar. They can no longer eat what they want to eat. They can no, the energy levels are in in a sort of fluctuating state beyond what they want to do or can do. If you think about um, people with depression, it's almost like you aren't able to do certain things because you something's missing, right? In other words, there's a point where you can um, start losing control over yourself and it's maybe not very clear why that is, right? And he seems to be heading in that direction. Okay, so he goes on to say, last paragraph, I will send shortly by good strain two cases of pictures of which you must not hesitate to destroy a good number. Now, that is also a kind of un Van Gogh thing to, to say. You know, he basically says, you know what, I'm going to finish this letter. He's just spoken about how beautiful trees are. It's a little bit um, unrealistic. It seems a bit over the top. And the next thing, he goes from that to saying, uh, I'm going to send you some of my pictures, uh, uh, do, uh, you know, like uh, knock yourself out, uh, destroy quite a few. You can see there's something Van Gogh doesn't normally – um, write like this. He doesn't normally think like this. He doesn't normally th- express himself in this way. So then he says, I had a letter from Will who's going back to um, someone. A very nice letter. Ah, oh, cancer. It is cruel and difficult. By the way, it is very curious, but do you know that during all this strange and inexplicable commotion, which has taken place in all and which I was mixed up. There was a perpetual talk of cancer. So, you know, that's something else that now emerges. Um, And again, there's a a real jumpiness to this letter. Uh, He's now also thinking about cancer. I understand that according to the beliefs of these virtuous natives who know the future so well, it appears, I believe that according to them, I must be blessed with that particular melody. So it seems like the good folk of all think that Van Gogh has got cancer, think that he has some serious ailment, which I'm not sure if they were wrong about that. I don't think it was cancer, but I do think um, that is relevant. It says, about which I naturally know nothing, but all the same, it's an occurrence which remains absolutely inexplicable to me. Besides, for the most part, I've completely lost the recollection of those days in question. Um, I do wonder whether 
when he says that, doesn't that suggest he was intoxicated? That he was, um, you know, seriously drunk or, you know, um, had, had consumed too much absinthe? And I think that raises two questions. Would a drunk Van Gogh be more likely to cut off his own ear or would a drunk Van Gogh be more likely to antagonize someone else that they would cut off his ear? Quite an interesting question, right? Anyways, he goes on to say, even if it were so, I should try to console myself by thinking that diseases like this are perhaps to men what ivy is to oak. Right? That's quite a... Um, Quite a, I think, true and brave assessment there that, you know, um, sickness is not something um, that you can expect to, to live without through the course of your life. And I mean, when you get married to someone, they say in sickness and in health, sickness is really a part of our lives as a part of other people's lives. A good handshake and many thanks. Goodbye for now. Ever yours, Vincent. At this point, he was 36 years old. Okay. And now, should we go on to one more letter? Okay. We're going to do one more letter, and this is from Saint Rami, April 29th, 1889. Written uh, around about a week from now. So, yesterday, Mr. Sauls, the Protestant minister of all, handed me your letter, which is at the same time a request for admission for your brother, a painter in all, and uh, Aral. He also told me the conditions that you want for your patient during his stay in the house. Among these conditions are that some that will be a, a pleasure to grant him. Among these conditions, there, there are some that will be a pleasure to grant him, but there is one that I cannot accept in advance, that of granting him permission to walk out of the establishment anytime he wants. You will understand, I hope, that under these conditions, my responsibility would be strongly compromised since I could not watch over him. You can understand that that... Um, uh, that what's the word for that uh, that exception makes sense you know he's basically saying Tipas, I can't let your brother roam around the, um, the premises um, I can't let him do that because um, I, I don't know what he could run away. You know, I, I can't take responsibility for what he does if he's roaming around the premises, you know, at his own recognizance. So I'm not going to allow that. And so you can imagine it being quite a big deal for Van Gogh to, to essentially hand himself over basically to be in prison. Like we're not going to let you walk around when you want to, you, you are going to be treated here like an inmate. Okay. Sign me up. So he says, what I can assure you in, ad in advance is that I've observed your patient for some time and have acquired the certainty that he can enjoy a greater liberty without inconveniences. I will be the first to grant it to him. I'm just trying to see where he says the word if. Oh, he basically says, after I've observed him, then I will grant that to him. Okay, so that does make sense. As for doing painting and not the not be sequestered in the establishment, I promise you that we will facilitate every means to allow him his natural tastes and in the house, allow him the greatest liberty compatible with his mental state. In the same way, we will grant him wine with all his meals, especially since all my patients drink wine every day. That's pretty crazy. Uh, okay, so it's not all day. Uh, but, but every day. I must tell you in these conditions, the price of the pension remains fixed at 100 francs a month and that it would be impossible for me to make a reduction. Well, that is actually quite expensive. I have to add that you will have to pay just for the first month a supplement of 10 francs for the medical certificate 
from the physician named by the administration to control the admissions of the patients. This expense is only payable for the first month. Medical treatment is given with the same solicitude for all classes of patients. I must ask you to give me his birth certificate at the time of admission. As for his clothing requirements needed to maintain the cleanliness of the patients, I have fixed this up with Monsieur Souls, who will accompany him to saint Rami. Sincerely yours, Dr. Peyron. I guess we're going to be hearing from Dr. Peyron from now on. Um, the part I actually wanted to touch on is where he talks about his derangement. Yeah, he talks about the ivy loves the old tree. Same thing he said to his brother. Yeah, it tells her I'm going to an asylum in saint Um I'm just trying to see where, where is the letter that he talks about the derangement. I will, so here it is. Uh, I'm jumping a bit ahead and we will read this in context, but he says, um, I was fighting a losing battle, or rather it was a weakness of character on my part, for I'm left with feelings of deep remorse about it, difficult to describe. I think that was the reason I cried out so much during the attacks. I wanted to defend myself and couldn't do it. For it was not to me, it was precisely to painters such as the poor wretch about whom the enclosed article speaks that the studio could have been of use. Where does he talk about the derangement? Yeah, he even talks about suicide. He says, if I were without your friendship, they would drive me remorselessly to suicide. But then he says, and coward that I am, I should end by committing it. So it's quite interesting that it does actually come up here. But he says he would do that without Theo's friendship. Okay. Now he's thinking about that within the context of going to this asylum where he may not be, where he may be treated like a prisoner. I just want to see if I can find the thing about um, Just can't find it. Have I passed it? Sorry, just give me a second. Did, did I go through it? Did I miss it in the previous letter? I think when I originally conceived of this live stream, I wanted to talk about him referring to derangement, another way of talking about madness. But um, I can't actually find it now. Yeah, he also talks to his sister about cancer. He 
Yeah, it also talks about suicide to his sister. <clears throat> anyway, I'm not going to take it further than this 29th of April letter. I did want to just highlight the reference to his derangement. Um, I now just simply can't find it. So anyway, sorry about that. Um, let's have a look at some of your comments. Uh, he was just at a very low point. Snowline says, ah, oh, how did I miss the beginning of this? Um, okay, so we're going to uh, come out of this a little bit now, and I'm going to tell you a fairly personal story. Let's see if I can bring up these slides. Is there anyone on um, on the stream that has something called Strava? Anyone on the stream have Strava? It's a fitness app. Anyone? Anyone, anyone? Okay, I'm almost done. I'll be done in a second. There we go. Okay, anyone here got Strava? Let's have a look. Jalsi says, my son. Uh, Yvonne says, no. <laughs> Zircon says, never heard of it. Zircon Strava was used by uh, Caitlin Armstrong, um, and it's, it's part of the Caitlin, Caitlin Armstrong case. Mo Wilson, um, Colin Strickland is also part of the fabric of the Nicola Bully case. Is also part of the um, Brian Koberger case. You know, he well one run basically. So. Uh, what you're looking at on the screen is a um, trajectory, a training tra trajectory um, that, that, that's basically showing my fitness over the past month. And you can see it's, it's gradually and consistently gone up by about 80% from this level um, to the current level. You can see there it says 80% over the past 30 days, right? So you can see it's basically had a um, consistent upward trajectory. Before we um, before we go into it any further, I had quite an interesting thought while I was putting this together. What would you guys say are the are the colors of the TCRS channel? The sort of theme colors, and what would you say are the colors of this channel? Let me um, put that in chat. What are the theme colors See what you guys say. Um, if you think about it, the theme colors of TCRS are actually 
yellow and black. You, you see yellow and black constantly in the text. You see yellow and black, although there is a bit of orange and red, but it, yellow and black in the banner, right? But it's basically yellow and black is the theme color of the true crime rocket science thing with, with a bit of orange, right? The theme colors of this channel are orange and green, but, but mostly orange, right? So if you think about it, the um, TCRS theme colors are yellow and black with a bit of orange, like touches of orange. And then the theme color of this channel is orange and I guess a bit of green. Now, if you, what I'm trying to get at when I say this is, um, I find the, the content when you're doing true crime to, to be mostly, for the lack of a better word, negative. It's about um, the tragic shipwrecks of human stories. It's about children who die or, or disappear. It's about families that break apart and people die and deceit and lies and all that. Kind of, it's all it's all kind of a, a negative narrative. And I find the more that I go into um, true crime, the, the less I'm able to train, the less I'm able to exercise, the less I'm... And, and so it, it literally is a trade-off. The more I want to exercise, the less I need to... Um, deal with that. And, and I do find it quite interesting that although um, true crime for me is quite a negative conversation, it's about victims, it's about people losing their lives, it's about um, nightmares, I try and bring in a little bit of the orange in there to say, you know, where does this come from in society? What can we learn from this? Um, how can we improve our critical thinking? In other words, you don't just make the whole thing a gratuitous negative narrative where you say, it's so exciting how shocking this is. It's so, you know, if there's a serial killer, wow, maybe the serial killer killed another 10 people. Let's go and find them. You know, in other words, it's like, let's make it as horrible, despairing, and terrible as it, as it can be. Really, where do you think that takes you? Where, where do you think that narrative personally takes you as a person, right? And so, anyway, I find um, in order for true crime to be meaningful to me, it needs to have that silver lining where you say, what can we learn from this? Where did this come from? Uh, what, what do we learn about ourselves in terms of how this resonates with us, et cetera, et cetera, right? But... Um, what I've really become aware of is to the extent that I've needed to find the mental resources to motivate myself, um, I need to actually step away from true crime, like significantly step away from it. And I've kind of have done that. Um, and so part of me going to Namibia was to make kind of a break from that. Um and um, I may be doing that more more in the future. I may be um, sort of, I don't want to say happy, but accepting of a much lower level of growth and income and all that kind of thing. So that the priority, I'm talking about like numbers growth and and income growth and all that kind of thing. So that my body can grow again and my soul can expand again. In other words, what I'm talking about here is, is how to get renewal within the context of a sort of damaging psychological environment. And that's exactly the situation Van Gogh was in. How, do, how does he renew himself? How does he come up with art? How does he, be, how does he remain creative when he's in an asylum? Right? How do you transcend that that very stagnant kind of environment, right? And there are two answers to that. The one answer is you need to be able to sort of focus. Um, but the other answer is you need to get the hell out of that environment. And that's eventually what he does 
about a year from now. Um, by May 1890, he's like, I need to get out of here. Um, this is, I'm, I'm not alive. I can't come alive in this situation. It's a totally different place that he is in 1890 to the place he is here. You can see he's very broken down right now, right? And so if you look at this graph, Uh, you can see there's been this consistent growth, but the the picture's incomplete, right? The picture's incomplete. So you could say the same about Van Gogh, that, that he's shown consistent improvement since the year incident, right? He's, he was nearly dead, right? He was nearly dead. Um, and he's consistently sort of improved since then. But, but that's not enough of a timeline to get a real sense of what we're talking about. Also, you need to see how has he come back from previous disasters and how many have there been. And that then brings us to, can you see, that is um, the timeline. That is the timeline for one month. Now we're going to go to three months, right? And that is three months. That's three months. Now, can you see on this three-month timeline, there, there's, there's a major drop over there, right? There's a major drop kind of in the middle of it. And so even so, it's still a significant um, increase. It's 350%. Um, of not not completely consistent, but a mostly consistent increase from an admittedly low level, 350%, but there's still that section there. Anyone know what that section represents? Like where, what is the reason for this, this drop here? Anyone think, know about it? Anyone know why this happened? Yeah, that's, that's the answer. Right. So um, I went to Namibia for a week. I got a really bad sunburn. I think that little um, that little piece there is where I, where I did the swim. But that that was the rest of the, the trip to Namibia. Uh, there really wasn't much time or opportunity for exercising. It was extremely hot. There was only a swimming pool in like one location um, and so on. Um, and then you can see a very nice recovery uh, after that. Look at that almost straight up when I got back. So I'd been refreshed, and then the energy I got after that certainly went into my training, and you have that situation, right? So anyway, that is um, three months, but the question one's got to be asking is, how did you end up all the way down here? How did you end up down there? I mean, it's, it's fine to grow, but how did you end up down almost at zero? I mean, I'm not at zero, but I'm not that far from zero. How did I end up there? Any, any um, thoughts about that? Those who know me, uh, it's the same like with Van Gogh, you know, you would say, how did you end up in the asylum? Uh, you know, if, if you take um, if you take Van Gogh's story, uh, where would you put that sort of bottom of the hole? Would you say it's when he loses his ear or when he's kicked out of the village or when he's in the asylum? I would say it's when he's the, in the asylum because I don't know if you've noticed over the course of the past few letters, he hasn't talked about any paintings. You know, he talks to Theo, but but there's no art that that is, is, is doesn't seem to have been painting whatsoever. He has actually ordered some paints, but you can see, you know, his his home is now being disrupted. What he's doing with his time is he's got to move his furniture around. He's got to find a new um, home. And so, what is he not doing? Well, he's not training in terms of his art, right?
So Mel says you stopped training. Lynn Lippy says COVID. Uh, Sharon says USA trip. Zircon says it was a hot summer. Yvonne says injuries or work. Um, Cornelia says, I think you were very focused on TCRS and the trial coverage. You're right about that. So um, here's the answer. And, well, let me take you to the next slide for the answer. That is going back six months. What do you see in the six-month slide? What do you see in the six-month slide? So that is the trip to Namibia. But you can see there's a nice recovery from that, and it's quite a steep recovery, right? What do you see in this? Mel still says up and down. So let me explain something to you about how co I almost said how COVID works, how Strava works. Strava treats your fitness almost like um, like a ball, right? A ball or a or a yeah a ball, and that ball is either rolling downhill or it is sort of um, being pushed uphill, right? So any day that you don't train, your fitness goes backwards with one point. Any day that you do train, but let's say you don't train very hard, let's say you go for a walk, then your that ball will slow down in terms of losing fitness. So in other words, if you train and you just don't train the next day, your fitness doesn't stay at that level. It immediately goes down slightly, right? And the more you don't train, the faster it starts going downhill, right? If you do train, but you don't train very hard, it goes up slightly. Um, it does take your heart rate into account, the time that you're training, the type of exercise. Um, the harder you train, the more you can push it up, right? And so um, what, what this is over here is where I got COVID, right? This point here is where I got COVID in America. So it was really a combination of two things. Uh, being in America, um, but really more COVID than anything else. I don't know why this is... Not just um, okay. I just want to see if I download this image if I can just show it off better. Let's just see if I can do that. There we go. Okay, so that's a bit of a better view, right? So there you have it, six months. That is the trip to Namibia, but there was a fairly quick recovery. You can see with COVID, it was a much slower recovery. Not only does it is this recovery very short-lived, but it's a lot more gradual. You can see that this is a steep, consistent recovery. This is a much more gradual and somewhat inconsistent recovery. So if you look at that graph, basically, Namibia was a intended thing. So it was something that, that I meant to do. It did disrupt my training, but not in a, not in a very serious way. COVID was not, obviously not intentional. And you can see it had a very um, serious impact. The other thing that you, you'll notice here is the time that goes by. Look at this. This is 
uh, so this is over a six month period, right? But that is October. And obviously, I didn't have COVID in November or December, but I didn't train. So I, I was still impaired. And when I did train, I trained and I didn't feel very good. And look how look how um, long this period of going downhill is. And look how long this period also is of going uphill. Really up until February, you know, it's basically being sick for about two weeks. But the recovery is literally about four months. November, December, January, February. And then suddenly something changes. Look how in March there's this sudden um, focus. Also, look at the difference of how quickly the fitness goes down here, but also how quickly it comes back up. That's a very sharp V over not a very long period of time. I basically got back to this level in a week. Whereas to get back to that level took about three months. Can you guys see that? So that's still not the end of the story. So, you know, COVID is one of the big things that happened to me. Anyone know what the other big thing was that happened to me that put me on another long downward um a downward sort of fall. So now we're going to look at one year, right? Now we're going to look at the one year mark. That's one year. And um, Zircon is right. Zircon is right. Um, Deborah says, do I have long COVID? I'm not sure. I'm not 100% not sure. Uh, so far, I'm not, not sure what the answer is to that. If I do have long COVID, it's not, it's not that serious. Um, but that is the, the right answer. The, the knee injury... Um, created a very serious setback, and you can see it over. It's actually not in this particular image. So this this actually shows you what a what a disaster COVID was. You can see how really motivated I was before I got COVID. You can see how fit I got, and then. And then it is basically just uh, uh, falling off a cliff over here. You can also see that I've surpassed the fitness I had when I had COVID, right? So this is um, one year. It's also overall, I'm at a much higher level than I was a year ago. But the question is still, why were you at such a low level to begin with? What, what's going on here? Why are, you at a, why are you at this low level to begin with? Okay, COVID, that makes sense. But why were you down here? Why were you down here anyway? And here's the answer. So hang on, this, is this six months? That's one year. So I think this is two years. And this, is, this really provides the answer. So this is the two-year study, and let's just do it like that. This is two years of training, and, and you basically see um, three main spikes, right? There's the biggest one by far, that one. And you can see after this one, that's when it, it remains at the bottom here. So this is by far the most serious setback. Um, not quite sure what I think 
I went to America somewhere around here. So I think this has got something to do with that. Um, but there's not there's not that precipitous drop so much over here. This is kind of a there's a drop, but it sort of drops and then goes up. Um, the the next precipitous drop is actually this one. So that's the the worst drop, and that's the second worst drop. So that and and um, so that is COVID. That one over there, that's COVID. This is the bone bone bruise that I got. This drop here, hold on. Um, this drop here is basically where I got the bone bruise. So um, essentially what we're dealing with here are three... Um, compounding disasters first of all i broke my ribs two ribs secondly i had a bone bruise in my knee and thirdly i um got covid right and which which of those three do you think was the worst which of those three would would you say is from the worst to the least bad? So if you'd if you'd asked me before the time, if you'd said, in the future, Nick, you're gonna get COVID, you're gonna break two ribs, and you're gonna have a bone bruise in your knee. Um, which one do you think is gonna be the worst? We, you know, I would have said, okay, COVID number one. No, 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 maybe broken ribs number one. Well, it depends on how bad the COVID is. Broken ribs, COVID, bone bruise. And it, it's actually the opposite. The bone bruise has been by far the, the most significant problem because the bone bruise means I haven't been able to run at all, right? It's almost like being a cripple. Uh, you can't run. So that's a significant setback. The broken ribs were actually the least bad because I recovered quite quickly. Um basically six weeks and then maybe a couple of weeks after that but the broken ribs were probably the quickest and easiest to recover from covid i would say was bad but but not as bad as the bone bruise certainly also didn't take as long to recover from so i would put it like this so so what I can say now, and um, I should have a, <laughs> I should have a big smile on my face. I, I sort of do, although I feel like more needs to happen. Um, I thought I was going to need surgery for the bone bruise. I did go for a MRI. Some of you know about that. I did um, think I would need surgery, and after a year, my knee was still hurting. I thought. Um, this is basically a permanent injury. And I'm, I'm very happy to be able to say two years later, I don't have any pain in my knee. I uh, don't want to say I don't have any. I, I, I would say I virtually don't have any pain in my knee. I'm running again. Um, not that long ago, I ran four kilometers, like consistent, con continuous kilometers. That, that is after um, I couldn't walk without any pain. And if I ran even a little bit, my knee would hurt. So, so that has gone away completely. Or I would say it seems to have gone away completely. So um, that has been a big surprise. Like um, in the same way that Van Gogh got syphilis and his life seemed to be on a downward spiral, 
I think what he didn't expect was that he suddenly turned the corner. Um, whether the syphilis disappeared or whether it just became mild, um, his body recovered, his body healed. My body has also. And so that is, and you know, when that happened was just when I needed it to happen about um, probably it was in January when I was basically at my lowest ebb. So basically at this point here, basically at this point here, which is about the lowest point that I actually ever got to, um, I realized, wow, um, I ran after Timmy and, I, and, my, and my knee's fine. I did a long walk with Timmy and my knee's fine. And I thought, I wonder if I, if I run a little bit, I wonder if there'll be any pain. And I ran a little bit and there wasn't. And I ran a bit further and there wasn't. And I ran even further and there wasn't. And I ran harder and there wasn't. And I ran further and harder and there wasn't. And there still isn't. And so a very unexpected thing happened right around the corner of getting COVID where there was a, I don't want to be overdramatic, but there were certainly a couple of moments where I thought I might have permanent lung damage. I, I may even nevertheless have damaged my lungs, but I also thought I could actually die here. You know, there's a afternoon somewhere in there where it was looking pretty bleak. And um, it took a long time for my body, to work with it, where um, my body slowly um, recovered from that, because there was a long time where I thought there's no way that I'm going to be training. I may even have lung damage. And in the middle of that, I realized, wow, I can actually run. <laughs> wow, I can actually, this worst injury of all of them I, is actually gone. Well, that's nice. And so in the context of this sense of, of having lost so much, lost so much fitness, there was a sudden green light. Uh, by the way, if you'd like to get the ball rolling again, you can, but um, can you, right? And so the reason I'm sharing this with you guys is because what I'm faced with is the opportunity for renewal, not rebirth. It's not like um, just start again, because I, I don't want to keep going up and down, right? I don't want to be the same guy just going up and down. So, you know, in order to um, have a to get back to, let's say, this level here, to get back to that really stellar level, which is it's not double where I am now, but it's certainly significantly higher. Um, what is the answer? What, what you want to manage your journey. You want to manage the journey. And so how do you do that? Well, you want to make sure you don't get sick you don't have some kind of mechanical injury where you break something. Um, and you want to make those spikes not, not so sharply upward, but consistently like that, right? Yeah, it definitely is not a not a nice, not a nice feeling. So in other words, what I'm talking about here is you want to learn from your mistakes and you want to you want to do go on this journey in a more informed way with better critical thinking and do it in a be effective, right? And so there are a couple of things that to me are necessary to to be successful and the one is I can't serve two masters. I can't. Um, I can't be on fire in true crime, and which, which, as I've said, is becomes a very negative psychology. And then at the same time, have the resources. In other words, enough sleep, feel fresh, feel positive, feel um, like I want to train. 
I can't do both of them. And so I think I've certainly reached a point where not only do I realize that I have to, but also want to um, uh, bring down my output um, in terms of the true crime stuff. I want to bring it down um, to a much lower level so that I can bring my output in this area, which for me is a priority, to a much higher level, right? And that is that is where you talk about renewal. And it's, it's not really reinventing yourself. It's, it's um, renewing yourself. I've obviously still got to make a living. You know, I can't just uh, completely abandon the true crime thing. Um, so I will obviously maintain that as a component. But I am very curious about what about um, documenting this part of my journey, um, you know, um, will there be an interest in that part? I'm certainly interested in it, but other people may not be. And so I'm definitely, I'm thinking about that. I'd like to do that, but I'm not sure if it's going to catch on. In fact, I'm quite sure it won't. I'm, I'm following other people's journeys in that respect, but they are world champions. I'm not a world champion. Um, my brother is a in the top five or six in South Africa in triathlon. And I'm, I'm thinking of like hitching my wagon in a way to him training, doing, doing some training workouts with him and then seeing how things go. But anyway, what I'm trying to get at is I'm um, on a bit of a triathlon journey and um, I'm in the process of trying to renew myself. But to do that, you've got to let go of certain things right? You've got to let go of certain things that, that you can see are not going to, over the overall arc of your journey, aren't going to be of use to you, right? Um, what is so incredible with Strava is in a, in a glance, you can see, um, certainly my Strava, you can see uh, what leads to disaster what or what has led to, to to disaster and so you can look back on two years um i don't think the um the rib the ribs that i broke are, are actually on this graph i think that, that's slightly off it i think it happened in april 2022 um but but what i'm getting at is Imagine if you could do this with your own, um, your own life uh, beyond beyond just the sport. The fact that you can do it with sport is is good, but imagine if you could do it with um, your own life. If you could measure your financial performance, your psychological performance, the the the, the happiness that you've had in life, with um, decisions you've made. Uh, the way you've allowed certain things to, like tragedies or crises or difficulties, to, to turn the trajectory of your life around. And then you can look at that and say, oh, so that is that is what caused these problems in the past. This is how I can deal with it in the future. And if you relate this to Vincent van Gogh, in a way, that's exactly what we're doing, is we look at the peaks and the troughs of his life and how they can compound with one another. That's the other thing that you've got to be conscious of. If you think about what's going on in the war with Israel and um, uh, almost said Iran, but Israel and, and, and Gaza and what, what, Israel and Hamas, um, if you look at that... Um, you you can see how it escalates. You can see how it has a compounding effect. And in the same way, you shouldn't see things in isolation. You should see it as part of a traject traject trajectory. Um, you can see in your own life, there are certain things you need to de-escalate. Um, it might be your eating habits. It might be... Um, 
I don't know, whatever it is, the time you're spending online, it might be um, a relationship with a person, right? Um, because things can compound. And when you look again, that one thing, which would on its own not be a very big thing, could be the straw that breaks the camel's back. If you take Vincent van Gogh, he'd been thrown out of his home before, right? He'd been treated as a pariah by the people around him before. He had that in the Borinage. Um, so that's not like the end of the world, you know, but compound all of those things together and it becomes overwhelming. So if you take, you know, he has, it, it all started with the fairy tale. He has these high hopes about the yellow house. He has this, this fairy tale, he has this, this dream, right? But does he think critically and realize Gauguin is actually a bit of a prick? Does he realize that Gauguin's actually selfish? Does he realize that Gauguin's actually not reliable? And I think the answer is, to some extent, he did know that. He does talk about that. But what actually happened is his emotions got the better of him, his, his hopes, his dreams, his enthusiasm, his excitement, his emotions got the better of him, right? And in a way, you can say, well, that's understandable. You know, he was really lonely and um, he was very excited about everything. Okay, but then don't let, let that happen the next time, right? It's okay to make mistakes and have these, these sort of travesties, but don't make that mistake again. Um, in, in his case, he has, it all starts with that hopefulness, then he loses his ear, and then that hope is not, that, that fall is so much worse because he'd invested so much. If he'd invested a little bit less, you know, it may have been different. You might say, but you can't live that way. You can't sort of invest. Um, you, you've got to put everything into something. And I would answer that by saying, yes, but you can also think critically. You can also say, okay, but be careful here, right? Um, it's, it's a difficult situation with Van Gogh because if you think about it, what could he have done differently? Um, he loses his ear, the people throw him out of alls, his brother gets married. How much of that really was under his control? But the issue really here is, how does he take this horrible episode from his life, which really plays out over less than six months? How does he take that horrible episode and learn from it? And, and then does he learn from it? Does he learn from that episode? What do you think the answer is? I mean, I think we know what the answer is because um, we know what happens. You know, he does end up leaving the asylum. But I would encourage you guys to try and think of your, your recent life, the last two years, as a kind of graph. And what were the low points? What were the high points? And how can you get that graph where you want it to go? What is the thing that's undermining your happiness? What are the things that are undermining your um, ability to live the, the sort of life that you want to be living, right? And one way, I think, a very, very good way to do that is by having Strava record every time you go for a walk, every time you exercise, and then you look back, you can look back at this sort of thing and see what you were doing, right? So I want to encourage you guys to get Strava. I can, if, you, if you need more information, I can help you guys out. But you're basically going to need quite an expensive watch, a Garmin Phoenix 7 or something like that. Write it down, Garmin Phoenix, F-E-N-I-X, right? And then when you do a workout, it'll automatically send it to the Strava app. You don't need to do anything. It just is all automatic. And it truly comes into its own when you start measuring your um, progress 
week by week, month by month, year by year. And then you, you can see, is my trajectory going up or is it going down? I mean, look at my trajectory. Is it going up or is it going down? And the answer is, it's great. It's been going up for quite a while, but it's certainly got a long way to go. And another thing you could do looking at that is say, Tipas, if I were you, I would maybe try and bring it down slightly because you don't want it to go like that. You want it to go like that, right? And so what Strava allows you to do is to see it kind of in real time. Now, when you look at it over a two-year period, it does look very, very steep. But when you look at it over um, one month, let me take you to one month. It looks kind of manageable, right? Doesn't that, that doesn't look like a very, very steep chart, does it? And so what, what this is, is a, is a great tool for self-management. And if you're not interested in a fitness journey, not everyone wants to, not everyone needs to. But then I do want to encourage you to think in the same way about your emotional and psychological journey. Um, a lot of you guys have come from the true crime community. Um, is that, and I, I don't include myself in it, right? Is your exposure to other true crime channels, is it, is it making you a better person? Is it making you a more rounded person? is making you think about life in a way that you think is helping your life, in a way that's constructive? Is it making you um, antisocial or uh, paranoid, or is it making you a kind of self-aware person, right? Th that's for you to decide, right? Um, I just see a, a lot of very bad uh, thinking in the true crime space where creators profit at your expense and that kind of thinking doesn't take you to a place where you're going to have the motivation to exercise for example where everything is worse than it is and everything is more shocking than it is when what, what happens when you apply that to yourself when you say am i strong enough to do this no no no, no. things are much worse than you thought you know, if you're in a really bad place, let's say you have cancer, or let's say you have a sickness, or let's say there is a crisis, and you say, um, you know, can I maybe turn my life around? No, 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 no. Things are much worse than you think. This is far more shocking and serious and bad and terrible. That's what true crime is teaching you all the time. Do you really need that in your life as much as it is in your life? Anyway, I'm just saying that certainly in this period of my fitness journey, I want to de-escalate my exposure to true crime. And there might be there might be exceptions. You know, a case might come along where I feel I've got something to say or I want to go into this into more detail. But overall, um, I can see my true crime graph going down my subscribers, my views, my income, and and I sort of feel like that is a necessary trade-off for this graph to go up, and I'm prepared to make that trade-off because I feel like this is more important and more valuable for me. Someone, someone else might feel the opposite. Someone, someone else might say, um, no, I need that more or whatever, and that's fine. Um, I guess what I'm trying to do is invite you along. I'm, I'm going on a fitness journey and I want to invite you to do the same. Let's have a look at some of your comments. Alina says, true crime shows me my circumstances are that bad. Uh, Snowline says, I've never been happier in all my 60 years. That's good to hear. Um, Chelsea says, turn off YouTube once in a while. Um, 
I don't, I don't know if you're going to ever hear a creator on YouTube saying to you, maybe you should watch content less <laughs> because it's not in their interest to do that. In fact, what they want to do is find any and every way to keep you hooked, keep you addicted. But is it a um, constructive, affirmative, helpful, healthy addiction? Is it good for you? Is it good for those around you? Deborah says, I used to do all this stuff, seriously as fit as an athlete, ups and downs. I'm going on 64 and walk every day with my dog. Okay. Uh, Terry says, I just turned 50. Terry, I'm 52. And how I see it is, um, you're probably going to laugh and those who are above 60 are going to frown, but I sort of see 50 to 60 as your last real shot at, at youth in a way. And what I mean by that is you can still be quite a good athlete in your 50s. Um, in your 60s, I think you can be fit and you can do a lot of things, but I think the speed really starts to um, diminish. I think you, 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 you can't deny that when you're 60, you are not a spring chicken anymore. And so just the way I see it, your, your 50s are really your last chance in, in an athletic sense to um, do a really good 10K and to challenge yourself in certain areas. Um, I think there are quite a few people who climb Everest in their 40s and 50s I think that number drops a bit after 60. I'm not saying when you're 60, you must get on your rocking chair and, and you know, watch the sun go down. Just that your, um, probably your chances of injury go up significantly because you are no longer a spring chicken, right? Yvonne says, I'm 59. I really feel the slowdown this year. Yeah. And so if you are in your 50s, you've got 10 years in a way to do all the things that you haven't done. You know, it's your it's kind of like not your last chance, but it's it's a um, block of time where you're still relatively young. That's all I'm saying. And and you've still got that ability to recuperate. Um, I also do a lot of walking. In fact, I think I strengthened my knee by doing extra long walks with Timmy, like four, four kilometers and so on. Um, I also want to say, because it probably sounds like I'm being ageist to those who are 60 plus, you could also challenge yourself to walk, become a walking champion in your 60s. And you could say, I'd like to be able to walk 10 kilometers in a day, you know, and just, um, you know, why sort of settle down in your 60s when you could be an active 60-year-old, even if it's in a walking sense, you know, um, and, but you might say, I don't know how Deborah feels about this, you might say, but I've, I've lived my whole life as an active person, I just don't actually want to do that anymore. And that's fair, that's how you feel. Like if Van Gogh had said, I painted um, right through my 30s. I'm just tired of painting. I don't really want to paint anymore. Well, then that's how you feel, and then that's what it is, right? But um, no matter who you are, you do need to maintain a certain amount of fitness in order to stay healthy, no matter who you are. And so one way to do that is to challenge yourself. That's all. Uh, Mel says, oh, how I wish I could go for a walk around my cooperative. Okay. Recovery time slows down. Then Nippy says, that's why I unsubscribe from other channels. I actually saw recently that South Africa's got the world's highest levels for um, being online. Quite shocking to see. Let's see if I can share that with you.
um, can't quite see it here, but um, see if I can bring it up. says here, uh, here is why South Africa is the most internet addicted country in the world. Well, let's see why. A staggering average of 9.5 hours online per day. Why is that? Accessibility to the web. I think there are other cultural reasons as well. But anyway, I just want to see if there's a better resource than that. It actually showed um, graphs. And it also shows where America is on that same thing. I just can't find it. Mm. I put it on Facebook, so it is there. Can't seem to find it now. It comes from this website, the Daily Maverick. But I don't see it anywhere here. See if I do a quick search on this site. No, I'm not, not really going to. It's just a bit of a... I don't really want to go down now, but, um, you know, that's also part of it is, you know, the extent to which you sitting in your chair online or whatever, you're not active. So that it is like a trade off. You can talk about how negative true crime is as long as you want. Sitting in a chair is also not very constructive. So anyway, I think. Um, What's really helped me, as well as my brother's really on fire in terms of his triathlon, and I guess in that sense, he, he is my Theo. <laughs> we do a little bit of training sessions together, and, you know, that definitely does help. So, you know, that's the other thing is, I just want to deal with Lynn Lippi's question, why, is, why, why do you think South Africa is like that? I, I feel like... Um, a lot of South Africans are sort of hiding away from South Africa. Um, crime, you know, like in America, crime is entertaining and interesting and fascinating. In South Africa, it's so real that, that people don't want to think about it or talk about it. You know, it, it cuts too close to home. And so um, I think there's a lot of escapism um, you know, um, there's a lot of attempting to escape reality by going online, you know, in the same way that teenagers do online gaming. I think South Africans go online just to be somewhere else in a sense. So I think that's part of the reason. 
um, South Africa is a very far flung country. You know, we're on the southern end of Africa. You know, there, there are not a lot of countries that are close to us. You know, if you go across the ocean, Australia is really far away, South America is really far away, Antarctica is really far away. And if you want to go to Europe, so besides the rest of Africa, if you want to go to Europe, it's a really long way to go, and America is even further to go. But but through the internet, you, you're there instantly. So I think it it gives one a magical sense of displacement. So I think that's kind of the reason for that. Wow, do you also read the Daily Maverick? Are you, um, Snowline, you aren't South African, are you? Because the Daily Maverick is a South African publication. Chelsea says, I can't sit, I have to keep moving. Um, I'm glad that, that someone here has felt inspired and that you're thinking about this. Is there anyone else here that, that is feeling the same as Alina? Snowline says, I'm in Canada. Okay. Okay, so Cornelia's left us. Um, I do want to encourage you guys to make suggestions. Um, I don't know how many of you are on Patreon, but um, for my trip to America, I've got so many ideas of where I want to go. Um, should I go to Rogersville? Should I go to Hendersonville? Should I go to Orlando? Um Am I going to go to, um, don't laugh when I say this, Modesto. They're, all, they're, they're sort of areas that I've written about that I've meant to go to but, but just haven't. Although it's easy to say this, it does cost money to go there. It does, And that's the flip side of this. Um, if I do go on this journey that I'm intending to go on, I'm not going to be going to America next year. I don't know if I'll be going to America the year after. Um, America is extremely expensive when you are from South Africa. So um, that's that's something I'm going to have to deal with. There are other alternatives uh, going to the Himalayas instead. That, that That is not as expensive, although I think it might be further away. Um, but it certainly wouldn't be as expensive. Anyway, um, I think that is it from me. Um, so we'll do Van Gogh Letters 81 um, next week. Zircon says the northern states will be cool. I guess that is something to consider. Valerie says... Um, Maybe I shouldn't be so lazy. Uh, Valerie, I think you're from Kansas, right? Um, if I do go to Tennessee and I'm on my way to Lake Tahoe, I, I don't think can I think Kansas is kind of on the way. Anyway. Uh, Yvonne says, can you consider moving to the U.S. permanently? Um, I thought about that, and again, uh, for me, the biggest issue is if I move to America, I would have to work hard to uh, kind of look after myself. So I, I would have to begin my career journey, not, not begin it, but I'd have to continue my career journey um, with an intensity that I'm not sure I want to do. Um I don't know if you guys have noticed my YouTube channel. I, I worked quite hard this month, and I covered certain cases, and I got 1,000 views here, 2,000 views there, and I was quite shocked. You know, you, you think almost when you've got almost 180,000 subscribers that, that almost any video you put up, you're going to get 10,000 views, and it just doesn't necessarily work like that. Um, so... So um, you you kind of realize in that sense, you've got to stay in the algorithm 
and and um, that's that's like I say, I feel like that's not something I want to do. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to sort of reveal too much about certain things, but I certainly am conscious of. Um, do, would I rather be in America than South Africa? For sure. I, I for sure would like to be. But is it practical? Is it viable? Those are other questions. Uh, thanks a lot, Deborah. Thanks. I think it's thanks a lot for that. So, yeah, I don't know if it's not clear. Um, the, the big um, announcement here really was just to say that you know, I had a bone bruise about two years ago, seemed like a bit of a death sentence and kind of big surprise. It shows the body's the body can sometimes surprise you. Can you can you imagine that it can take a year and a half for something to heal in your body? And you would imagine that if it doesn't heal after a week or a month or three months, that it's a permanent injury. And it just shows you that there are some mysterious aspects to the body. And, um, you know, I was seriously considering surgery. And then I was thinking, well, you know, I think it's tickets. You know, you, you're you getting old and you've damaged your body and it's just something you're going to have to live with. And it just shows you that the, the body can surprise you. I guess the mind can as well. So I'm definitely, I feel like I've been given a second chance and I'm, I'm feeling a little bit of a funny sense of, wow. Uh, so I guess I have another chance at um, some kind of sort of happiness, uh, some kind of achievement in a dimension that I sort of um, lost a bit of optimism about. And that's quite a nice thing and to, to think. And the same thing happened with Van Gogh. You know, he went to the asylum and I think there was this period of stagnation, this period of decline, and then he recovered. And, and I, I think he he didn't feel he had too much control over that. I didn't feel like I had control over my bone bruise. And then the body sometimes works in mysterious ways. I think Yvonne can Yvonne can uh, attest to that. You know, sometimes you aren't in control, and just the the wiring of your body is going to determine how what the outcome is right i think so too zircon um it is i know when i did the iron man in 2005 when i when i finished it and i was i had like a silver foil around me and the the i think the i don't know if the stars were out because it was drizzling but certainly standing there in the dark at the end of a day where you'd spent the whole day moving yourself, right? Um, basically, um, you start at seven, I think. And I, that, that day had been a 12-hour day, so I must have finished at about seven in the evening. And the whole day, you've just been moving. You, you swim almost four kilometers. You cycle 180 kilometers which is a long way to drive and then you run 40 kilometers which is also a long way to drive but but to realize well i i i, I locomoted myself over 220 kilometers on a bicycle in the sea and running on running and walking on on a road all fueled on bananas and water and and whatnot um, it's quite an incredible thought. I did that in one day. It's quite an incredible thought, just how powerful the human body is, that, that the human body can get itself, move itself, 220 kilometers. It's a long way to drive, powered on, you know, bananas and candy bars. And you think what you put into a car and, and um, the machinery that's designed there, well, we machines as well are pretty efficient too. Uh, what does Yvonne say? Uh, thanks, thanks, Yvonne. We love you <laughs> we, and support the choices you are making. We will be there with you in whatever way you allow us to be. 
Thanks, Yvonne. I appreciate that. By the way, I will be taking you guys with me to America. So uh, in the same way that I covered Namibia, you know, the interesting snippets of America, I'll try and do the same with America. Um, I'll, I'll also take along a device that connects your phone to the rear view mirror. So while I'm driving, you can see where I'm driving. Um, so, yeah, so it should be quite fun. Um, and I'm, I'm also taking a GoPro camera. So one of the first things I want to share with you is, spoiler, <laughs> is um, can you believe I have been to Manhattan? Um, it's basically every time I go to America, it's through New York and Manhattan and then back through New York and Manhattan. So I've been to Manhattan about six times and I've never – jog through Central Park, it's something I've always wanted to do. Well, now I'm going to be able to jog through Central Park. So what I'm hoping to share with you guys is me jogging through Central Park with a GoPro camera on my chest. And um, I'll take you guys through that. Uh, hopefully I'll get through that without any niggles or anything. So um, should be fun. Um, how about that for an amazing fitness journey where you say, I want to go for just ordinary jogs in the in the nicest places in the world. I want to jog on that beach. I want to run to that temple. I want to um, go for a walk on that, um, I don't know, city block or um, promenade or whatever, um, right? Now, if you think about with true crime, you go to where that – case happened, that case happened, well, why not also do that with fitness? Go to where that mountain is, go to where that national park is, um, tick off the list of, uh, there's a thing on outside online right now, the list of America's 10 best hikes. I think I've done, sort of done, no, actually, I, one of them is the a, a sand dune in the Great Sand Dunes National Park. I didn't really go up those sand dunes, but I, I certainly was there. Mel says, I'll jog vicariously through you. Thanks, Yvonne. Um, Eddie says, use Timmy's GoPro. Yeah, I will. I will I will do that. Um, ne nearly drowning for sure. Uh, anyway, so uh, so that's it from me. Um, you guys are, have the inside track on what I'm sort of intending for the other channel. I don't think it's going to be terribly good news for those folks, but um, it's not like I'm retiring. I'm just bringing things intentionally down a couple of notches. Some of you may have noticed it already anyway. Um, I'm just the thing that definitely does bother me is some of the cases that matter to me don't seem to matter to, to others like Boeing. I really want to talk about Boeing. I think it's dealing with a big thing, you know, um, America's corporate culture of greed over safety profits over safety. It's so it's a tight and submersible story. People just don't seem people doesn't, doesn't seem to have the same, resonance as a, as a little boy that's missing. And as far as I'm concerned, it's such an important story. It affects all of us, but it's also an important challenge to the way American corporate culture thinks of itself and how it needs to rethink of itself. And it's not just American corporate culture. It's, it's um, all over the world. Um, greedy corporations, it's, it's an international thing. But I think it's important that we start thinking about it because this whole this whole idea of profits over safety isn't that how you end up in in climate change? Now I don't really care about climate change, the safety of others, other organisms, the safety of the planet, the well-being of the planet. I, all I care about is money, and that's kind of the conversation I've been having with you guys. Um, um, it shouldn't be profits above everything. Right. Um, think about Van Gogh as the poster child for someone who didn't who thought of art and 
what he, the calling he felt in his soul as a higher calling than money. Even if he didn't sell his art, it was still worth doing. Um, even if people didn't recognize what he was doing, if he could recognize it in himself and it meant something to him, and ultimately it's not like he was deluded, what he was thinking and feeling was um, was an important interpretation of the world that could inspire the people, and it has and it did, so it really was worth something. Thank goodness he continued. Thank goodness he didn't think in a totally mercenary, results-orientated way. Anyway, um, okay. I think the next time I'll see you on this channel, I won't be in my office in South Africa. So I'm literally going to be at the mercy of Boeing's safety or lack of safety over the next couple of hours. Think of me. I'll certainly be looking at the window panels and and looking at the plane as I go into it, uh, having covered it, it cuts a bit close to home. But, you know, as far as I'm concerned, those safety flaws are going to, the cyclical issue is going to start manifesting maybe in 10 or 20 years, touch wood. Um, but it's still an important thing to sort out now, isn't it? Anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, just a final thing uh, while I've got you guys here. Um, I did a video on Amanda Knox's email part three, and I found something that I thought is really, um, powerful i found the original footage of the crime scene it's like i think it's about two hours long so i found it and i thought this would make a powerful backdrop to my narration and uh, youtube promptly demonetized it i did cut out all the sensitive so so that video had already been um sent not censored basically yeah censored so you can't see the victim, um, but I'd, I'd kind of censored it even more to cut out the where you see a lot of blood, and I'd um, censored it even more. And I just thought it's important to actually see what all this fuss is all about. This is the authentic footage. And when I put it there, YouTube promptly demonetized it. So... Um, I, I just find it tremendously frustrating, um, very frustrating. Anyway, I'll see if I can try and put up a shorter version of it and maybe um, YouTube will let it go through. Um, we'll see. Um, I might actually put the raw video onto Patreon. Um, it's very big. I don't know if Patreon can handle such a big file. I think it's like, seven gigs or something but maybe i should do that um in the meantime okay safe travels let's hope so so i'm gonna i'll keep you guys updated remember members only on the tcrs i'll be um revealing where i am and what i'm doing in a more more sort of continuous way all the fun stuff so where, where i'm running or um, just traveling and enjoying the sights and sounds that'll be on the Team Petrie channel. So I'll see you guys there. Um, who knows, I might bump into a couple of you. I might see Terry because I'm going to be in the, the, the Lake Teho region and I might actually pop into the Prosser Lake area. I mean, covered it so much and I, I, I don't know, I think if I'm there, I might as well go there and just, I don't know, um, I feel like I want to be there. Um, and then I'm just trying to think who else I know. Um, I might see both Stephanie's in, in New York towards the end of my trip. 
um, we'll see. I am actually, although my original plan was to be on the East Coast, looks like I'm going to be going to the West Coast anyway. Um, this seems like fate. <laughs> I, always, I always end up heading towards California. Um, I do have some friends there, so that's, I guess, what it's about. Um, is... Is is Elise here? Because Elise, I think, is in Boise, Idaho. I just don't quite know if I'm going to head that way. But um, I still haven't gone to the biggest organism in on the in the world, the Plano Forest, which is in Utah. And th there's a part of me that feels like I really need to do that because, you know, this whole idea of renewal um, isn't the best place to renew yourself by the tree of life, right? So symbolically, that would be an important stop for me. I'd love to go there. Whether I can is another story. I guess we'll see. How long do I plan to be in the States? My ticket is booked for a month. So basically um, a month from or around about this week. So coming back in late May. But um, there are all sorts of things tempting me to stay a little longer. Also may look in on the Richard Allen trial in Delphi, which starts in the middle of May. Um, but the, I must say their force is drawing me away from that particular case. Maybe I'll pop into that case on my way back. Karen Reed trial, I may also visit. Um, we'll see. So um, I should be there between four and six weeks four and six weeks. I will wear a mask on the plane. Um, uh, when did you get sick, Yvonne? When was the last time you got sick? I must say, I quite like Indiana, so I, I can see myself back in Delphi. Um, anyway, we'll see. Yeah, that is long enough. Um, I'm actually hoping to go to Italy in October, but obviously the longer I'm in America, the more I'm going to need to recover <laughs> financially from that. And also um, um, I've got to try and keep my fitness up while I'm in America, which is easier said than done. Now that I can jog, um, I can really jog anywhere. So I'll, I'll be in Myrtle Beach to begin with. So that should be fine. But when you're on the road, it's not easy to to jog. And also combining the whole true crime thing, um, I, I tend to not exercise when that's going on, especially when you're on the road. It's difficult, but maybe I can do it. We'll see. Timmy will miss me, but his babysitter will be with him and he really loves her. He, he sort of barks in a very excited bark when he sees her. So um, he'll be in good hands. Oh, are you still sick? That's, that's, that's not nice to hear. Okay. I um, hope you found this episode of Van Gogh Letters um, interesting. Um, I really do think we're going through a very interesting phase of Van Gogh's life. Although it is very, it was very hard for him. Um, it's very interesting what he reflects on and what he thinks about it. So, um, so I think, you know, the, the next um, couple of episodes of Van Gogh Letters, 81, 2, 3, don't miss them. I think they're going to be really, um, really interesting. Okay. That's it from me. Uh, keep weaving, and I'll see you guys next time. <laughs> Ciao. Thanks a lot for being here.